From the New York Times, look at this. Ew, hey. look at that guy in the middle. Michael Knowles. <laughs> <laughs> is that who you're talking about? No, I meant the guy next to him. Oh, Rudy Giuliani, yeah. No, 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 the other guy on the other side. Of Michael Knowles is a very handsome man. <laughs> I never Michael Knowles. Hey, guy look, leaves me speechless. It's me from Milwaukee. <laughs> and now uh, you got Ben Shapiro over here. It's stuck around the bottom. But look, they made me very prominent. But Michael Knowles is, uh, is the go-to guy. They put him in the center. I don't even think they mention him in what the you, article. You, can, can we read lips? What is he saying? Uh, he's saying you subscribe to Freedom Tunes. <laughs> they just released a very funny video today on Kamala's husband. That's what he's saying. So this is the uh, the infamous story that was coming out where everybody said, you know, that they were trying to censor prominent right wing channels right before the election. But um, you know, the thing is, the uh, the article itself is nowhere near the front page. It's in the technology section, and it was actually kind of hard to find. So this is probably just some like young new hire guy who was like, I got a story and they're like, sure, whatever, dude, we don't care. And then he ended up, he ended up publishing just basically nothing. Do you think they kind of buried it because like everybody, like Benny Johnson and, and uh, Ben Shapiro and everyone was talking about it before the thing came out? No, because they wouldn't, they wouldn't have messaged everybody. Hmm. Like by sending a message to literally everyone, it was like, the issue is that they failed. The story, uh, 30 conservative channels posted 286 videos containing election misinformation. I post like 15 videos a day. So out of 30 people, there's an average of around like nine or so videos per person over the span of like six months where we're all posting like eight to 10 videos per day. They're basically saying you have one days out of one quarter where you may have made an error. And it's like, oh. And so YouTube well, in the New York Times has never made an error. Huh. Not once. So. The YouTube just responded like none of these things break the rules. If they break the rules, we'll take care of it. But none of these things do. Thank you and have a nice day. Here's the funny thing. When they mention me, they mention uh, me and Benny Johnson and uh, Tenet. Nowhere in the article to say I said anything at all. It just says that, uh, you know, uh, Benny Johnson. Actually, this is really this is factually incorrect. This is fake news. It says uh, Tenet paid popular pundits to create content. That is factually incorrect. Um First of all, if you want to get real technical, a production company was paid by Tenant Media for a licensing agreement. There was never an exchange of money to me personally, but that's just picking hairs, right? The reality is that uh, I, my company, or any entity uh, I, hear, I own was paid by anyone to create content for anyone. We already made the show. They just wanted to redistribute it. That's it. But that being said, he then doesn't even mention me. After that, he's just like, Mr. Poole did not respond to a request for comment, and then nowhere else am I even mentioned in this. So, fine, I guess. What is this? A correction was made. An earlier version of this article misstated the number of videos that YouTube reviewed when asked for comment and whether they contained misinformation. YouTube said it reviewed eight videos, which were identified by the New York Times and referenced in the article, not all of them, and found that those eight did not violate its community guidelines. It did not comment on whether they contained misinformation. Well, I got news for you, buddy. You published fake news. So That is election misinformation during an election, and I think YouTube should ban you. Yeah, I think YouTube should ban them. Listen, I think that the New York Times is a horrible publication with a long history of being terrible, and that, that goes far, far, Holodomor. far beyond this. But yeah, the Holodomor is a great example. Uh, the whole, I mean, but they have a history of denying these kinds of things. They even get criticized um, for not properly covering the Holocaust back during war the World War II era. So... The Holodomor specifically, though, they had a, a foreign correspondence reporter with the USSR named Walter Durante, who it literally came out just made up basically everything that he said and everything that was published because he was a communist who wanted to deny the fact that millions of Ukrainians were starved to death. And he won a Pulitzer. He was a staple at the New York Times. FDR decided to officially recognize the Soviet Union as a nation in large part because of Durante's reporting. This man who covered up the starvation, the death, the intentional murder by the uh, of millions of Ukrainians by the communist government. Um, and I'm just going to be honest. I don't think the New York Times has gotten better since then. I really do not think they've gotten better since then. They've lied I, I about disagree. so many things throughout the year. Oh, they've no. gotten much better at lying. Oh yeah, fair enough. They have gotten a lot better. Uh huh. Yeah. See? Yeah. yeah. The way you yeah. Go, she I would is. agree. They've gotten better at lying. <laughs> I mean, they're looking. They were looking for uh, looking to media matters for uh, information on the people in this particular piece. I mean, going to media matters. They're they're literally they literally exist to be a um, basically to, to do hit pieces on people. You New know. York Times, you're posting fake news. You got to issue corrections. And it's easily verifiable because if you just read the indictment, it literally says that we had a non-exclusive distribution license. We were never paid to create anything. So they just make things up.
I mean, and that's actually a, a very serious and egregious false statement. Yeah. Oh, man, I don't know. I might have to uh, call my lawyer over here and see what's going on. <laughs> and see what we got here. He's got a message. Oh, we're suing Kamala Harris. Well, listen, part, part of yeah, that's true. You are. I think the other thing is the New York Times is probably, I mean, the New York Times is desperate to retain its relevance. And this has been a problem for many years, long before any of us were on the scene commenting on these kinds of things. As soon as journalism started shifting towards the Internet, people started publishing online and print media was, be, was becoming less viable. The New York Times has been very worried. Uh, about how they were going to stay afloat. And I remember some years ago, I was in a media literacy class, and we watched this documentary on the New York Times, and I believe it was the uh, the like chief manager there at the time was speaking to a crowd of other people who worked at the New York Times about how print media wasn't out and the New York Times was still fantastic. And the answer that he gave to them is, you see all these popular stories online, well, I'll have you know that even though they got all these views in these different news websites that are purely digital, many of these stories were broken in traditional print media or on the New York Times. And you just go, okay, you dingus, the whole point is they're moving away from traditional media and there's nothing you're doing right now that digital uh, journalists or people publishing online can't do. So they're trying to cling to relevance. They're very upset because they're not just losing profitability, right? Like they are losing control over a narrative. They've had a tremendous amount of power for a very long time. They abused that power horribly by covering up genocide and lying to the American people and supporting totalitarian regimes. And it's crumbling down around them. Couldn't happen to a nicer group of people. Well, the, the fact that they're trying to uh, regain that that control over the narrative is probably the, the key piece to mm -hmm. what they're doing here. I mean, not it's not just X, although X is is was kind of leading the charge. Um, but you see the the rever reverberations of X being a platform where other voices are actually heard. I mean, like it, we would mention the uh, new, the Washington Post and the Bezos um, yeah. op-ed the other day. You see YouTube turning this you know turning them down or saying no there's nothing that they've that these uh groups have have done any they haven't done anything wrong so we're not going to do any kind of strikes or anything this if this was five years ago youtube would have bowed as soon as they said hey do this because the narrative was totally controlled yeah it was there was almost a hundred percent control by the the establishment i mean you had the fbi lawyer uh, an fbi lawyer was leading the uh the I forget what the the desk was called, but he had he had a desk at Twitter. I mean, the the there was no distinction between the federal government and the essentially the tech companies and the media. It was all one. It was all part of the blob, you know. So the the fact that Twitter has or X has made it possible for dissenting voices to be heard without being, you know, um, just booted for having a dissenting voice, it means that other other organizations and stuff are going to start are going to start, have started to to fall away. Yeah, well, and I think there's a, an additional piece here, which is that as of 2023, YouTube has a new CEO. So aside from this being an election year and them desperately wanting to remove conservative content because they don't want the vote to be swayed or just dissident content in general, it's possible they also want to send a message to the new CEO of YouTube. Yes, we will try to get advertisers to boycott you. We will make your platform look bad. We will smear you if you allow dissidents to express opinions that the New York Times doesn't consider to be acceptable. Yeah, when you, under when, when you start to understand that the New York Times is just a bulletin board, a blog, for the deep state intelligence agencies, then it makes um, seeing through the bullshit like some of these articles mm -hmm. uh, way easier. In fact, you should probably subscribe and watch all the people that are on that thumbnail. Indeed. Yeah. They're good. Good people. That's right. Let's, see, let's take a look. Listen, the New York Times trashing you. Yeah, maybe not is, Steve Deese, um, but everyone else. New everyone York else. Times trashing you is. <laughs> you got honestly... Cash, you got Elijah, Knowles, Tucker, Ben, me. Uh, who's the guy in the top left? Stinchfield. Ah, we got Cash. Cash him. And that's Steve Deese. There you go. But these aren't the 30 channels. Like, the interesting thing is, who are the other people that they reached out to? They don't say. Researchers found. Yeah, and interesting that they couldn't name them in the article or wouldn't name them in the article. Yep. Yeah. Researchers, the, the people at, at Media Matters, they're calling researchers. They're literally just people that, you know, scour Twitter. They're not researchers at all. They're, oh, yeah, yeah. Oh, a bunch yeah. of white dudes for Harris. Yeah, well, yeah. Indeed, that's probably all it is. 
Yeah, so when the story broke, I was just like, ah, oh, who cares? Like, I get st- like I hear stuff like this all the time, mm-hmm. you know? So everyone was acting like it was going to be this big deal. But I do have an update. I do have some news for you guys. Let me just uh, check over here with my messages, and then we'll give you some breaking news. Um, one second. Just uh, some breaking well, news over here. Yeah. So um, uh, we have sued the Kamala Harris campaign, as most of you know. If you would like to support our work, go to TimCast.com, click Join Us, Become a Member. The Kamala Harris campaign has been served, I believe, actually uh, some time ago, not that long ago. And uh, let me just make sure I can double check my notes real quick again. We are expecting a response December 15th, and uh, which is very, very likely. This stuff takes a very, very long time, and it'll be interesting to see what happens. I don't know what's going to happen I'm curious as to what happens if Donald Trump wins handily on the 5th and Harris just concedes. I don't know. But uh, going to be another month and a half before we get any more more updates. Uh, I, I guess my understanding is that they requested the uh, the ability to reply by December. Hmm. I wonder what that means. I don't know. Yeah. Indeed. Interesting. But yes, the lawsuit is, is, moved, is moving forward as it as uh, is as, as it does. And these things often take years. So uh we will see what happens. Lawsuits take forever, and it sucks. Yep. Indeed, they do. Indeed they Can you do. give a recap on why you're suing them? The Kamala Harris campaign took a post of me out of context and claimed that I was a Trump operative who supported Donald Trump having extrajudicial authority to round up and execute Democrat voters. They posted a clip. Classic Tim, always saying those kinds of things. <sighs> Absolutely crazy. Insane. In the, uh, in the shows with Laura Loomer... I said that uh, if there, the, the just the, the full context is, if there are Democrats that have committed crimes, and we know some who have, they should be criminally charged. There should be an investigation, evidence, criminal charges. There's got to be real warrants. There's got to be real evidence. And then after the trial, if they're found guilty among a, a jury of their peers, then they will be sentenced. Laura Loomer then said that the people who committed treason should get the death penalty. Ending the show on that remark, we talked about in the extended after show that I don't believe any of these people actually committed treason, sedition, perhaps. But we're talking about like Joe Biden with documents. It's not treason or sedition. That's a document charge. If they're going to charge Trump for it, they're going to charge Biden for it. And so you need legit, legitimate uh, charges. And uh, I, I went on to say that I don't agree with the death penalty. I believe that that death penalty is wrong. I believe that the current law prescribes a death penalty and that if someone commits a crime under the current law, they should under the law, receive what the law prescribes, though I don't agree with the law, the law prescribes. And uh, for this, I have uh, uh, filed suit because they have made false claims about me. It's actually absolutely insane. And it's the basis for which why Sam Cedar will be here tomorrow. <laughs> because he made a video where he opened it saying that I said something about people should get the death penalty if they commit crimes or whatever. And it, it's, a, it's, a, it's an absurdity out of context. And I'm just like, either this dude only gets his news from clips he hears, like the three second clip, Completely out of like I could be quoting someone who's going to claim I said it, and that's the problem with a lot of the stuff. They think it's true. So upon seeing that, I said, "Okay, Sam, he's, you, you can come on the show and we, and we'll talk about it." That's going to be tomorrow morning, and uh, and we will talk about it. And then he can sit here and I can say, "Here's exactly what I think." Next question. Here here's exactly the issue, and so uh, it is not confusing. But if you read the actual lawsuit, you can see all of the details and our arguments, and we lay it all out. And uh, the Harris campaign knew what they were doing. I think. I think they absolutely knew what they were doing. So we'll see. We'll see. Well, I mean, they're so accustomed to just being able to lie about whatever they want. This is why we just saw that ad a little while ago where people were saying, in seven days, I I don't know if I'll be able to own a dog anymore. Things that aren't even political issues and that nobody's talking about. They really feel like they feel entitled, firstly, to say that Donald Trump is uh, the author or person who commissioned Project 2025. And then uh, when he hasn't even read it and has nothing to do with it. And then... They will make up all sorts of false allegations about what's in it. So they've just gotten used to being able to flagrantly lie. And then eventually they tell direct lies about people and misrepresent things that they've said. And I really hope that uh, you're able to take them to court and, and that they lose because they need to learn a lesson for this. You know, and, and the establishment is is where you hear people complain the most about misinformation mm-hmm. and disinformation. And yet they're every bit or more guilty of spreading falsehoods Mm -hmm. as uh, any podcaster or or anything. Way more so. I Name a podcaster who lied us into a war. Yeah. Thanks for checking out this clip from TimCast IRL. Make sure to watch the show live Monday through Friday at 8 p.m. Subscribe to this channel, and we will see you all there.